Well, welcome again to our pre-launch service. Um, we are going to have multiple pre-launch services. This is exciting times. We're glad that you're here. And if you'd like to be on the launch team, again, try to connect with me right after service. We'd love to get to know you. Um, over the course of the last four weeks, we've been talking about our core values moving forward. Our core values are going to be the definitions in the staple blocks to this church on how we're going to build and build with uh, sustainability, longevity, and strength. And so uh, values, values, what do you value in your life? I guarantee you whatever you value in your life is what you're actually doing with your life. Until you take ownership of those values, then all you have is just good assumptive values. But we're not looking for assumptive values, we're looking for actual values. So what will be the actual values of Thrive Church moving forward? We've already talked about our core value that we don't just believe in God here, we actually value him. We build all of our ministries around him. I wouldn't be here unless I valued God at the core of everything of who I am. With all my mistakes, with all my blunders, with all my fumbling and messing up throughout the years, I still value God because more so he values me. So God, we are gonna value him. That's our core value. Number two, we talked about people. Without valuing people, and I'm not talking about lip service in valuing people. Okay, a lot of websites with churches they have core values, but a lot of times it's lip service. It's just put on a page. How many of you guys ever worked for a company that says, we value this, and we value this, and we value this, and then you ask the employees, what do you really value? I just value lunchtime and break time. <laughs> what does the company value? Uh, it it's does, definitely doesn't look like what our mission statement says. Listen, we're not going to be a church that's about lip service. We're going to actually do what we say. We're going to do what we say. And so we value people. Without people, you don't have a mission for the church. And without people, there would be no reason why Jesus even was sent to the earth. People matter to God. And number three, we talked about discipleship. Discipleships where we take people through a process to become more and more like Christ. And we will have a streamlined discipleship uh, process here at the church. Then last week, we talked about a core value called identity. This church will value you for who God tells, declares you to be. And I don't even care if you don't believe what God declares you to be. We're going to help disciple you to believe it over a matter of time. I am more interested in what God says about you than what the lies in your head say about you. I'm more interested about what God and his word says about you than all the fear, that what fear says about you. I am more interested in what God says about you than what your inadequacies say about you, what your insecurities say about you, what your failures say about you. I want to know and partner with what God says about us. Identity. We value your identity as defined by God, not defined by CNN, Disney, or any of the other social networks or platforms out there. We look to the word of God to define us. Amen? Amen. So today I want to go ahead and talk about our fifth core value. I promise you, you're going to like this fifth core value. Uh, the next core value I'm going to address, all right, is at the heart of God. It's at the heart of God, and it's the main reason why he sent his son, Jesus, even to come to earth. And so let's go ahead and pray. Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would reveal to us your heart in today's message as we unveil the fifth core value. And God's people said, amen. You see, our Lord saw the brokenness of our humanity, and Jesus wanted to do something about it. In other words, Jesus didn't want to just speak to one of his prophets of the Old Testament about doing something. He wanted to actually come in and get his hands dirty to do something about this. This core value will be one of the, the, the hallmarks, will be one of the main thriving fruits of this church. This core value will actually apply to you today, for some of you, it's going to apply to you today. For some of you guys, this core value will not apply to you at all today. But mark my words, mark my words, whether it applies to you today or it does not apply to you today, one day it will certainly apply to you. And whatever this core value is, when I dis disclose it to you today, whether it applies to you today or it doesn't apply to you today, no matter what, it should resonate within your spirit. It should resonate within your spirit. The core value is one of the main driving factors that give people courage to even go to church. 
Why? Because everybody in the world who is trying to find a church values this core value that they're looking for. This core value is the only thing that will bring emotional health to your life. This core value will eradicate shame out of your life and condemnation from your life. It's what brings restoration to those who've been abused by authoritative figures, including parents, family members, and even churches that have been toxic. This core value will minister to the brokenhearted. This core value will have the power to set you free. And this core value revolves around the nature of who God is. It revolves around the nature of who God is. It's what the forefront of Jesus' ministry was all about, and it's what every single human that has been made in God's image absolutely needs, whether they know it or whether they don't know it. Everybody needs this core value. The core value of Thrive Church, number five, will be healing. Everybody say healing. healing. We value healing because healing is what restores us, Healing is what regenerizes us, and healing is what gives us a future hope. Without healing, we remain stuck in our funk. Without healing, you remain stuck in your brokenness. Without healing, you may remain stuck within sin cycles within your life, trying to get free, struggling to get free, and on and on these sin cycles go. Why? We need healing at the core of who we are. Healing. Jesus talked about pain in this life. He said, in this life, you will have hardship. Take note of it. You will go through trouble, but know that I've overcome this world. So Jesus is the anchor to healing because Jesus is the one who's overcame this world and gives us a future hope. But we gotta cling to him. Listen, church, we need a radical, a radical raging dependence on God if we want to get healed. Ecclesiastes talks about this. Ecclesiastes talks about this. We all go through seasons in this life. We go through seasons of laughing. We go through seasons of celebrating. We go through seasons of love. We go through seasons of just bless. We go through wonderful things in life. But there are also seasons where we hit bumps in the road. There are also seasons where you are going to hit some struggle in your life, and you're going to hit hardship in your life, and if we don't know the anchor to the hope, and if we don't value healing, we're just going to deflect God and remain stuck in our brokenness. We've got to recognize the seasons in our life, especially the seasons where God is saying, I'm trying to get a hold of you because I want to heal you. The reason why things are collapsing all around you is because I'm trying to get to the core of who you are, and I want to release healing, I want to release my presence into you, but you got to recognize the season that you're in. You can't be deflecting. You can't be trying to go off, and I'm just going to numb my pain by working harder. I'm going to numb my pain by looking at entertainment. I'm going to numb my pain by, and I, I, you know what, we love ice cream. We love ice cream. I'll call that the benefits and the blessings. But we can't avoid the stuff of brokenness in our life. All of us are in a healing process, whether we know it or we don't know it. Some of us are further along than others, but regardless, God's not done healing us quite yet. We gotta recognize the seasons. I know in my life, I can name three or four seasons instantly, and I'm talking about seasons. And by the way, seasons shouldn't be years. Because if seasons were years in your life, then it wouldn't be called a season, would it? Like, think about it. Oh, yep, we're still in fall. Well, it's May. Still in fall. Well, it's August. Still in fall. Well, your season has become a lifestyle. A lot of Christians blame seasons. I'm going through your season, pastor. It's all about this season. This is an interesting season. I mean, well, how long have you been in that season for? Five years. Well, it's a long season. I don't think that's God's plan for your life, to be stuck in a season. The Israelites were stuck in a season for 40 years because they couldn't grasp the God of healer. Listen, they were saying, God provide. Oh, this is a word for this church. God provide! They're calling out for Jehovah Jireh. God provide. But God reveals his name as Jehovah Rapha. God, the healer. Listen, you can cry out for provision all you want. 
But until God gets a grip of your heart and brings healing, the provision won't come. What do you think God's trying to do here at this church? He's trying to release healing, healing, healing. God wants to heal us from the inside out. In my life, I can think of seasons of healing. And I say seasons of healing because it was a good six months. So one, the first one was about nine months, followed by a big, pre, uh, big follow, follow up of continual education to get healed. 2001, I had to deal with my dad. Gulp. I had to deal with my dad. See, I, I was raised in a very abusive home. Violence was normal. Emotional abuse was the norm. I, had to, I watched my brothers and sisters get beat. I watched my mom cry. I watched them live at separate parts of the house. It was a war zone in my home growing up. I wasn't raised in fear. I was raised in terror. I was raised in terror. And so um, when I went off to Bible college, I was all, freedom, I'm out of here. See you later. And then by the time I was done with Bible college, why am I so jacked up? Why am I so messed up? I, I thought I was going to be a pastor one day, and I can't even have enough strength to clean toilets. I'm homeless. I have nowhere to live. I literally was. I lived in the nursery, sprayed, <laughs> raid around my uh, sleeping bag because it was infested with roaches. And God said, I want to heal you. I'm a good father. You've been crying out to Jesus your whole life, but Jesus' whole goal was to reconcile you to a good father. So I had to learn the father's heart, and that took a big season. And God brought, provided mentors into my life to help me work through that season. And then I was like, all right, I'm getting good. I'm, I'm healthy, and I'm entering this season of incredible growth. And then once again, 2016, 2017, 2017 rolls around. God says, I want you to go seek out your dad. I go seek out my dad. I start crying. He's living by himself. He's going to die. He's going to die unless there's an intervention. And so I intervened, and I didn't realize it. I had to learn that my dad had dementia. And I had to learn to deal with chaos, and I didn't, know what, I didn't know he had dementia. And so we were getting to these verbal arguments because I would just keep repeating myself, and he would keep attacking me and attacking me. And I'm like, well, I already dealt with the healing. I'm not looking for your approval. I'm doing this because I'm a good son of God, and I'm going to wash your feet. You, you see? It's hard, you know, being a caregiver to an abuser. It's hard because it requires you to go even lower. I have no problem going low. I've been low, and I'm low right now. <laughs> I'm low right now. Why? Because God's bringing me through another season. 2017, I had to become my get dad's caregiver, and God ended up reconciling, because how many of you guys know, you can deal with people who've offended you in the past, but it's entirely different when God calls, us, calls you to reconcile with the people of your past. And this was reconciliation. God ended up using me in healing my dad's heart and in healing my dad's heart brought even more depth to my own healing and what he accomplished in my healing already from 2001. It was about 15 years later. So uh, God's into healing. In 2018, um, I go off to Danville, and I'm like, <laughs> Pastor Rixall, I want you to do a series on Revelation. And, um, and I'm about ready to do this series in Revelation, and I suffer a major blow to my head. I had a brain injury. And it took me about two years, three years to recover from that brain injury. I, with every ounce of strength, tried teaching the book of Revelation and faking it to the people for about two years, preaching, teaching, when I would just go to the back room when nobody's watching, and I would just cry. Why? Because I'm in so much pain. So much pain, so much physical pain. Sit, I couldn't walk through the, uh, through the vitamin aisle at Walmart. I would get all overwhelmed. I cannot process like I used to. I lost some of the sharpness. I lost some of the, the quickness. I was, used to be quick like a cat on my feet when it talked about verbal communication or maybe sometimes uh, defending the truth of the gospel. I would be quick on my feet. But for two and a half years, three years, it was difficult. I was slow. But God ended up healing me. It was a process of healing. It was a process of healing. Even there was a season in my life where there was a time of healing where God was just purging me, purging me of my flesh, purging me of sinful sin cycles that were in my life, purging my flesh. I would consider that a season of healing. Listen, we all need healing. 
You're going to be times in your life where you're soaring high. Just got married. Amen. Six months later, almost got in a car accident and lost my life. Healing. Up and down, down and up. Life is full of turbulence. But if you don't value healing, you'll get through life. And then you'll stand before the Lord and say, I missed out in life because I didn't really know you as healer. I just thought you were savior. And so we got to recognize seasons of healing. And let me tell you something about healing. Healing, the healing process is sometimes more painful than the dying process. For example, if you have the disease or you have an infection, you got to get that infection out of you. You can numb it. You can prescribe medicine to it you can you can drink away all that you want to numb it and do things and you you, you've learned to live with the pain you've learned to cope with the pain but you know that if you don't deal with the infection the pains could actually you're going to end up dying so then you go to the surgery table oh god this is what we've dreaded the surgery table when god lays you down in green pastures cuts you open and says i want to deal with this Oh, it hurts, it hurts. It's all right. Holy Spirit's the Novocaine. He's a good comforter. And I need more comfort. I need more comfort in this healing. Okay, he takes the infection out. And then now it's time for recovery. And now you're like, I can't hardly move anymore. I just got a knee replacement. It hurts more than how it was before I even did surgery. I don't even think this healing thing is worth it because it's so painful. But then after six months of recovery, you're like, oh, I feel good, but the healing process was sometimes painful. But the outcome of the healing process is something that's absolutely beautiful. I always want to tell people this. Never follow a leader who has never been broken. Never follow a leader who has never taken ownership of their brokenness or has never accepted the brokenness in their life because if you do, you will be hurt by them. Yet if we can take our, all of our brokenness, if we can take all of our low points and really seek the Lord and having a radical raging dependence upon him in our pain, we will encounter the God of healing. The problem is that people, all of us, by our human nature, we want to avoid all forms of suffering. Amen? We want to avoid suffering at every single cost. We would much rather deflect our pain we would much rather numb our pain. We would much rather lash out because of our pain. And if we do that, it actually creates more brokenness in our life. Yet if we take all of those pains, all of those struggles, all of the loss in our life, and we present it before God as a sweet aroma, as a sacrifice, we will find the Lord of healing. And sometimes his healing is instantaneous. How many of you guys like that healing? Healing, bam, you're done. Healing, bam, you're done. I like instantaneous healing. Peter said, money and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk, and immediately his legs were strengthened and he got up and walked. But there are times also where healing takes a process. Healing is a process. Healing is a process. And so there are many ways on how God will heal and touch and manifest at this church, Thrive Church. Healing will take place in relationships at this church. Listen, if people, people hurt us, but God uses people to also heal us. So relationships are going to bring healing at this church. We have an amazing discipleship process at this church that will be rolled out probably next year sometime. And that, we're going to equip people how to walk in healing and how to release healing to other people. We're going to be a ministering church that's going to release life and healing to people. Healing will also take place in all of our ministries here. Healing will take place, here we go, with the manifestation of the presence of God in our Sunday morning services, where people will come out of their cars and they'll begin to encounter God right in the parking lot. I look forward to the day where the doors open here at this church and people come in and they just start crying. They just start weeping. Why? Because the presence of God's goodness is such, so manifested in this place that people from the world or first-time guests, they're going to be like, I don't know what's happening to me, but something good is happening on the inside. I'm, I'm getting restored, and I don't even have words to articulate it. But God's presence is here, and I just can't get enough of God. Listen, we are a spirit-filled church. And if we're a spirit-filled church, 
we actually believe in the manifestation of the presence of God for God's spirit to give something of himself into the human heart rather than just teaching on principles on Sunday morning, we're going to go ahead and connect you with the heart of God on Sunday mornings. And in that, in the presence of God, his spirit's going to end up healing people just in our regular services. And it won't be just a rare occasion. It's going to be a resting place for God in this church. Amen? What I love about God's healing is God's healing goes beyond Jesus' teaching and goes on to Jesus' touching. Listen, we can teach on healing all we want, but you'll never get healed. I can teach you on healing all you want, but you don't need the teachings of Jesus when it comes to healing. You need the touch of Jesus when it comes to healing. So we want Jesus to begin to touch bodies, touch minds, touch hearts. And that leads to my three points that we're going to hit today. God's healing presence is going to heal minds here. God's healing presence is going to heal hearts here. God's healing presence will heal bodies here. All three are going to be healed here. And sometimes the healing will take place instantaneously. Sometimes it will be a process in which we're going to have to not grow weary in doing good and laboring and contending for God for breakthrough. But regardless, this place will be a place of healing. Amen? Amen. 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 So God's healing presence, point number one, will absolutely heal minds here. Heal minds here. Does your mind need to be healed? Does your mind need to be healed? Matthew 8, 24 through 27. I love this story because uh, Jesus is in a boat and he's sleeping in a storm. Why? Because his mind is filled with peace. The disciples, on the other hand, are all stressed out. And so again, the first point of of this is going to be God's healing presence heals minds. But there's three types of minds that God wants to heal. The first one is God heals minds that are plagued with stress. God heals minds that are plagued with stress. The disciples are all panicking. They are thinking they are going to die. Matthew 8, starting in verse 24, says, Suddenly a great uh, tempest arose on the sea, and the boat was covered with waves, waves, waves. But Jesus was sleeping. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to die. Aren't you stressed? But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? He arose, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, calm. There was a great calm, great calm. So the disciples, they're worried. They think they're going under. They are stressed. And by the way, it'd be different if they weren't fishermen. It'd be different if they were painters. They're like little rip in the sea. We're dying. No, these are seamen, okay? And so they are used to going out to the sea and catching large fish. They're used to waves. They're used to stress. But this wave was so big, it stressed them out. Do you ever hit waves in your life that are so big that it stresses you out? And so Jesus, he's asleep in the storm. You see, there's waves all around this property right now. Waves all around this property, waves of financial struggle, waves of I don't know if this is going to happen, but where's Jesus? Is Jesus stressed out? Is Jesus panicked? Is Jesus worried? No, he's sleeping, but are the disciples stressed out? Are they panicked? Are they worried? You see, it's different dealing with waves out there than it is with waves in here. And what does Jesus want to heal? He wants to heal the waves up here in the brain. Because you could be sleeping in the storms out here, but that peace will only come if he can heal the mind of stress. God wants to heal minds that have been stressed out. Is your mind plagued with stress? The good news is Jesus, with one spoken word, can heal that mind, and you can still see the waves. And you think the problem is the waves, but really the problem's the wind. And really, the problem is the wind. And Jesus, what does he do? He silences the wind. You see, Jesus expressed and manifested the peace of God on the outside. And he brought calm because he already had the manifestation of presence of the Spirit on the inside, which already brought him his peace and his calm. 
God wants to take the peace and the calm in here and get it out here. The problem is we have waves up here, and then so we create waves out here. You guys see that? So we want to be wave calmers at this church. And so minds that are plagued with stress, God also wants to heal minds that are plagued with tormenting fear. Tormenting fear. I'm not just talking about regular fear. I'm talking about tormenting fear. First John 4, 16 through 18 says this. God is love in that there is no fear in love. Perfect love dries out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear actually at Greek word there in the New King James. That's why I like the New King James sometimes. Punishment is actually the word torment. You see, perfect love drives out torment. Now call me ignorant, but I firmly believe most, not all, but most of the mental issues and mental illnesses in this nation and even physical illnesses stem forth from a tormented mind that is plagued with anxiety and tormenting fear. The enemy wants to hijack minds with fear and anxiety. It's the fear it's the feeling of losing control. It's the feeling of panic. He wants you to dwell on things that will always go wrong with your life. Fear wants to cripple you. Fear wants to go ahead and isolate you. Fear wants to immobilize you and bury you, bury you to the ground so you bury all the talents of good that is within you because you can't see the good that's within you because it's buried in all the dirt around you. And so God wants to set minds free. Perfect love drives out fear. So if we're dealing with a torment in mind, it's because we haven't been perfected or matured in God's love. God says we love because he first loved us. So there's a receiving component that's involved with receiving God's love, healing the mind of torment, so then we can go ahead and love others. Jesus, or sorry, uh, Paul puts it this way in 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of love, power, and a soundness of mind. Listen, if you have love, power, it automatically results in a soundness of mind. But if you do not have a soundness of mind, you will not have a mind that's filled with love or any power. You will have a mind that's filled with waves. You will have a mind that's filled with anxiousness. You will have a mind that's plagued with all the fears of the what ifs of life. God wants to set people free from that. He's given you a spirit of love and power. Well, what is that spirit of love and power? That is the Holy Spirit, and he is love, and he is joy, and he is peace. Love, joy, and peace should be the staples of a healthy church in the body of Christ with minds. God wants your mind. He wants your mind to be filled with peace. However, as a church, we can't allow the spirit of fear in here. I'm not going to allow the spirit of torment in this place. We're going to welcome the manifestation of the presence of God because God is the one who gives us the spirit of love, power, and a soundness of mind. And then number three, God wants to heal minds that are plagued with condemnation. Minds that are plagued with condemnation. You see, when you sin, when you sin in this life, the enemy comes in and he cloaks your, the guilt of the sin. He begins to cloak it with shame. And so now once when there's sin in our life, and then he cloaks it with shame and condemnation, now he begins to lie to you about who you are in Christ. And he says, yep, look at all that. Look at this. You're going to lose everything in your life. Nobody's going to like you. If everybody really knew who you were, you know that you're not really forgiven. You know that you're a hypocrite. You know that there's nothing that's good within you. He wraps you with shame, so now he gets you to agree with what hell says about you. That says you're not forgiven, you're not pure, you're not holy, you're not blameless in his sight. He begins to part, you, be, you, he gets to your mindset, he gets to your belief system, and so now you forget about your identity. That's why we covered identity last week. Why? Because we're covering healing this week. You're always going to have to stand on your identity when you're dealing with healing because the healing process is sometimes so painful that you're not even going to believe that you're loved by God. Because all I feel is pain. God's healing you. No, he's not. He's killing me. No, he's healing you. <laughs> healing you. Healing you. Check out uh, John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11. Jesus is being tested by the Pharisees. 
In John chapter 8, let me get to John. Uh, the Pharisees catch a woman in the act of adultery. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with this story. Um, it says, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. So she's caught. And when they had uh, set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned. But what do you say? What do you say? And they said this, testing him, that they might have something to which they can accuse him of. You see, the Pharisees are looking for ways to accuse people. You can always tell who's working for the enemy and who's working for God. Because if you're working for the enemy, you're looking for a way to accuse people. Who's, who's the enemy? Well, the book of Revelation says that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And what does he do? He accuses you before the throne room of God night and day, saying how horrible you are, how condemned you are, how unforgivable you are, how lazy you are, how much of a fraud you are, how horrible you are. These are all accusations, accusations, and this is the enemy's plan for your life. It's to accuse you. And this is what the Pharisees are doing. They're looking for a way to accuse Jesus by ultimately accusing this woman who is caught in the very act of sin. And notice how Jesus responds. He says, hey, whoever has the first stone, let him go ahead and stone. Uh, uh, whoever has the, um, no sin, let him go ahead and stone the woman who does have sin. And one by one, the accusers begin to walk away. And then pick it up right here in verse 10. Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman was left. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Has no one stayed here to condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I. Neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. You see, Jesus, he eradicates, he eradicates condemnation from your life. But a lot of us, when we sin as Christians, the mind is plagued with shame and guilt. But if you can experience the God of healing, he'll eradicate the shame and guilt off of your life and heal you from sin cycles within your life and set you free. But it's all a result of his healing. Jesus says this, in Jer or sorry, God says this in Jeremiah 3.22, come to me and I will heal you of your backsliding. Are you a backsliding Christian? Guess what? We all backslide, including your pastor. We all backslide. Are there times in your life where you're further ahead in God? And there are times in your life where you feel like, oh, I've, I've actually lost ground with God. But the reality is God hasn't lost ground with you. He's faithful to his covenant with you. And so he who began the good work, he is the one who's faithful to complete that which he started in you. Listen, it takes God to love God. It takes God to love God. But in order for us to fully love him, we gotta encounter the God of healing. We need our minds to be healed of stress. We need our minds to be healed of anxiety and tormenting fear. And we need our minds to be healed of condemnation and shame. The next thing that God wants to heal is our hearts. Hearts, everybody say hearts. Hearts, God wants to heal hearts right here. And there's two types of hearts that God wants to heal. The first one, we learn about it in Luke chapter 4, 18. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So you can imagine. The next point of the sermon is this. Jesus wants to heal the broken. Jesus wants to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus wants to heal the brokenhearted. There are two types of things that cause your heart to be broken. Number one is you experience loss in your life. Loss. Loss. I lost my dad. I lost my parent. I lost my business. I lost something in my life. The next thing that causes a heart to be broken is friction in relationship for too long until something within you actually shatters. The actual Greek word for a broken heart entails that there's a rubbing. Have you ever been rubbed wrong by somebody? person next to me is rubbing me the wrong way. That person next to me is rubbing me the wrong way. That person at work is just rubbing me the wrong way. Actually, every time you say that person's rubbing me the wrong way, what you're actually confessing is that person's breaking my heart. Because the Greek word for broken heart means to be rubbed 
in such a wrong way where it causes constant friction. And when friction begins to rub and rub and rub and rub and rub, there's a heat that's exposed there. There's a fire. There's a tension in the relationship. And eventually, when that relationship gets rubbed wrong continually, there is an actual shattering that takes place on the inside. And once when that heart's been shattered on the inside, you can go to all the Dr. Phil's that you want episodes. You can go to all the Oprah shows and go, woohoo. You can read all the self-help books and you can go to all the counseling and you can go to all therapy and that's all good. But nothing, according to Jesus, can heal the broken heart except him. Because God's not just interested in fixing a broken heart. He wants to completely restore it, re-energize it, and give you hope and become a new person. God is into healing the broken heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. And then next, God wants to heal hearts that are just burnt out. Are you burnt out? God wants to heal hearts that are burnt out. You've just been busy with life. You're exhausted. You've been carrying a heavy load, and there's more demand. And every time you look around the corner and you think you're going to get a little bit of rest, boom, you got to do this. You got to respond to this email. Got to respond to this text. Got to respond to your boss. Got to pick up the kids here. Got to take them off there. Got to sign up for health insurance here. Got to pay a bill here. Got to keep the dinner running. Got to wash the dishes. I'm just burnt out. I'm a parent. <laughs> All the moms and dads say, I'm burnt out. <laughs> Jesus wants to heal this type of a heart as well. And how does he do it? Well, he says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Doesn't that sound good? Jeremiah 31, 25. I will refresh the weary soul and replenish all who are weak. Psalms 21, 23, verse 1 through 3. The Lord is my good shepherd. I will not want. He makes me lie down. Please, God, make me lie down. Not in a sick bed. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He's talking about the flourishing life right there. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, your soul is connected to your heart and your mind. God wants to restore your inner man. If you've been burnt out, Jesus says, just come to me. Listen. Jesus is more interested in touching you than he is in just teaching you. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to engage him. He wants you to encounter him. Church is not about gaining principles to better your life. I will say that again. Church is not about gaining principles so you can better your life to become more successful in the world. Church is about encountering God so you can become like Christ to the world. And draw people to God himself. You see, we serve God for selfish motivation. I, se I serve God because he's all of my motivation. I need him. I'm radically raging dependent upon him to transform my mind, to transform my thinking, to transform my heart. God wants to heal the hearts that are burnt out. He wants to heal the broken hearts. And then finally, if the worship team can come out, God wants to heal bodies bodies, bodies. There is a plethora of scripture throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that confirms that God wants to heal bodies. In the Old Testament, God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha, as Yahweh Rapha, which means I am the God who heals. And then he heals people in the Old Testament. And then what did Jesus' ministry consist of? Healing. Did he pray for the sick or did he heal the sick? Say it. Come on, disciples. Did he heal the sick or did he pray for the sick? Jesus heals the sick. He heals the sick. He heals the sick. He heals the sick. Where there's faith, he does the miraculous. God wants this place to be a house of miracles. God wants this place to be a house where his manifestation of his presence is felt on the inside, where minds are being healed, hearts are being restored, bodies are being recovered. God wants healing, and it happens from the inside out when we invite the God of glory into the house that he originated. This is his house. This isn't Pastor Billy's house. This isn't our house. This is God's house. And we all build around the presence of God. And what does he do? He heals you. He heals you of broken relationships. He heals you of a mind that's been tormented. He heals you from a guilty conscience. He heals 
the heart that has been burnt out and he absolutely is willing to heal bodies. He's willing to heal bodies. Matthew 8, verse 3, I'll close with this. A guy who had leprosy on his hand, shriveled up hand, says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me healed. If you are willing, you can restore my hand. And what did Jesus do? He said, stretch out your hand. I can't, I can't. So what does Jesus do? He stretches out his own hand. Jesus is not afraid to touch your sickness. He touches a person that the world would run away from. You see, Jesus, this is, this is the beauty of the holiness of God. God's holiness does not repel himself away from you. God's holiness draws his heart closer to you. God wants to enter into your sickness. He wants to coddle you in the sickness, but he wants to pull you out of the sickness so you can be restored. But we think, God, Jesus says this, hey, it's the sick who need the healer. It's the sick that need a doctor. And Jesus says this, come to me. Do you need to come to him this morning? What areas of your life do you need the Lord to, to absolutely touch and heal? Every one of us need healing. You're at your low point, midpoint, high point. If you're at a high point, you're going to need healing one day. I don't care how mature you are in God. I don't care how many years you serve him. I don't care how many degrees you have. One day, you're going to need the God who heals. And I'm telling you, we want this place to be a house of healing because when your day comes, you're going to want to be absolutely restored. When your day comes, you're going to know, want to know that you're absolutely loved. And when your day comes, you're going to want to know that God is drawing near to you. He's not drawing away from you. He's drawing near to you. God wants to heal. Amen? Let's all stand.